Amen. You may be seated. To your classes downstairs, for those of you remaining upstairs, we, I would ask that you turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, we've spent the past couple of weeks looking at the church, what is the church, how is the church organized, who leads the church, and we are now going to dive back into our study of the Gospel of Mark. And as you're turning there, I'd like to ask you a question. Have you been to the zoo before? Some of you? What's your favorite um, animal at the zoo? The lion? Everybody agree the lion's pretty good? The lion was always hiding from me. I never actually got to see the lion up close because it was always hiding kind of around the corner up on the rock, sunning itself. There's all sorts of animals there. You get the bears, you get the giraffes, you get the elephants, you get all sorts of cool stuff. But the lion is probably the one that I'm drawn to the most. I love The Lion King growing up. That was one of my favorite movies as a kid. And uh, if you've ever been there, you go to the lion's pen, and I'm pretty sure this is universal, regardless of what zoo you go to, regardless of what country you're in, there is always a sign at the lion's pen. What is that sign or on the fence? What does it say? It says, don't climb the fence. There's a lion on the other side. Don't climb this fence because there's danger on the other side. There's something you don't want to run into on the other side of this. And I found that out because I started to climb the fence when I was younger and my dad, I think figuratively, maybe literally, smacked me on the back of the head and said, no, look, there's a sign here. We shouldn't do this. We need to stay away. We need to be warned. Is that sign a stupid sign or a relevant sign? It's pretty relevant, I think. It's not there willy-nilly. It's there for a purpose. It's there intentionally. It's there to keep people off the fence because there's danger on the other side. Our passage this morning, and we're going to read um, a lengthy passage here, our passage this morning has a real and relevant warning for us, a real and relevant warning for everybody, regardless of your age, young, old, male, female, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, there's a warning here for everybody, and we need to hear this warning. So I'm going to begin reading in Mark chapter 7, verse 31. And we are going to read down to the end of chapter 8, verse 26. When I get to the end of verse 26, I'm going to say, this is the word of the Lord. And I would like you as the congregation to respond with, thanks be to God. So let's read Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 31. This is what Holy Scripture says to us today. Then he, that is Jesus, returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. He sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. 
The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven baskets for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Seven. And he said to them, Do you not yet understand? And they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led, them out of the village, led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home, saying, Do not even enter the village. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let's just spend a moment in prayer. Father, we come before you again. We have lifted up your name in song. We have come to you in your word, and we have come to you in prayer, and we do so again because we are a needy and dependent people. We recognize that we need your spirit, we need your grace to understand your word, so we ask that you would help us today. We think of this day, Lord, being Mother's Day, and we know that this is not a church holiday. It is not something that the church started or instituted, and yet we recognize, Lord, it is good and valuable to remember, to recognize, to appreciate, and to pray for our mothers. Lord, in a day and age that that belittles motherhood, that wants to destroy womanhood, we thank you for the gift that is womanhood, the gift that it is to be female, made in your image. We pray that you would, you would give encouragement to our sisters in Christ in the midst of a dark and dangerous age that, that wants to tell them that who they are and what they were created to be. The world tells us that, that it's not worthwhile and Lord, we know that you have created male and female, beautiful in their roles, beautiful in their bodies, beautiful in who we are. And so we thank you for the gift of womanhood today. We pray for our mothers. We ask, recognizing that not all of our mothers were good, not all of our mothers were faithful, not all of us knew our mothers, but we are here because of them. And so we thank you for them. We, we lift up those who long to be mothers but can't. Lord, we weep with those who, because of sin and the brokenness that comes through sin, we weep for the brokenness of, of the physical body. And there are many who long for the good gift that you give but are unable to because of the brokenness of sin in their bodies. And Lord, we... We lift them up to you today. We ask that you would comfort them. Comfort them in their, their hurt and their pain like you did for Hannah in the Old Testament. We pray that you would give assurance that, that they are still loved because they are children of God. And Lord, we pray for all of our mothers, all of our sisters in Christ, and we, we pray that you would help them to all find their identity in Jesus and in Jesus alone. You give good gifts but the greatest gift that you've given is your son, Jesus Christ. And so we lift up these prayers, these petitions in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we ask all these things in his name. Amen.
Well, this passage this morning was a little bit longer, as you would have noticed, and it might uh, have caused you to ask yourself, why did Mark record these kind of events? I know it's been a while, a month or so, since we've been in the Gospel of Mark, but surely you haven't forgotten what's gone on in Mark's Gospel. We've seen things like this before, haven't we? We've seen miraculous healings. What kind of healings has Jesus performed in the first seven chapters? You're allowed to answer. What have we seen? He's healed lepers. Who else has he healed? The blind? Deaf? The paralyzed. The paralyzed man who was lowered in. Son, get up and walk. He's healed a man with a withered hand. He's healed Peter's mother-in-law who had a fever. He drove the fever away. He healed the demon-possessed. He spoke. He confronted. And he drove them away. He healed a bleeding woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. No doctor could heal her. No doctor could make her physically well. And yet at the touch of Jesus, she is made well again. He brought a little girl back to life. On top of that, as if that weren't enough, Mark simply makes the statement, and there were many, many others. The, the list isn't even complete. Only God knows the final count of how many were healed in the first century as Jesus walked on the earth. We've seen something like those first 10 verses that we read in chapter 8, the feeding of the 4,000. We've seen something before, right? We've seen something like this? Some people agree? Yeah. Where, where have we seen this before? He fed not just 4,000, he fed 5,000 men. The text is specific, 5,000 men plus women and children. We don't know the final number of how many he fed. And actually, if we look at the details, kind of comparing the 5,000 plus with the 4,000, it looks pretty similar there's compassion, there's bread, there's fish, there's a large crowd, there's telling them to sit down, there's the disciples collecting leftovers. There's different details, they're very different accounts, but they look very similar. So why would Mark tell another story like this? Why another feeding? Why more miracles? What is Mark trying to accomplish here? What is he trying to get his audience to see? And what does Mark, what does God through Mark want us to see and understand today? As we work through Mark's gospel, it's important for us to constantly be stepping back and taking a, big, a, a look at the big picture. That's why I read a larger section this morning. We've just read a series of shorter accounts, smaller accounts that are kind of back to back to back to back, right? And they seemingly have nothing to do with one another. They might seem disconnected and disjointed, like we don't know how these quite fit. But when we step back and look at them as a whole, we see that Mark is doing something intentionally. Mark is driving at something. He's pushing his audience to see something. He's not just telling the same stories over and over again. Mark hasn't forgotten that he's already told these types of stories and he's just repeating himself. Mark is using these accounts to teach us something. And he's doing it through, and I've, I've mentioned this term before, it's been a number of months since I mentioned it, but he's using this literary term, it's not very deep or very theologically deep, that we just call the sandwich, right? Sandwich isn't very deep, right? Sandwich is not, doesn't sound very theological, but it's this technique that Mark uses to pair things together and slowly work towards the middle to help us see something. So what's he doing? On the outside, what we have is these two stories of healing with spit, right? There's the healing of the deaf and mute man and the healing of the blind man. That's on the outside. Move in one step and what do we have? We have discussions, we have an account circling around this theme of bread. Jesus feeds with bread, and then he uses bread as an analogy, an illustration to teach the disciples something, and then move right into the middle, move right into the center. What do we have? We have this interaction, this debate, this argument in verses 11 through 13, this encounter with the Pharisees. The outside is what holds the sandwich together, right? You need the bread to keep it together as a sandwich. But the center is where Mark is drawing our attention. That's the meat, that's what Mark wants us to see first. So we're gonna start in the middle and work our way outwards. We're gonna start with this interaction with the Pharisees and slowly take steps out. What do you put in the middle of a sandwich? Meat. Now, if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, I think you can still understand the, the point of this, okay? If, even if you don't eat meat and you'd rather put peanut butter on the inside, you'll just have to run with it here, okay? So you put meat in the middle, and then surrounding the meat, you have the fillings, right? 
ketchup, mustard, lettuce, tomato, whatever you want, doesn't matter. And then on the outside, you've got the bread. So we're going to look at that in three stages of this sandwich. Let's look at the meat in the middle first, okay? This interaction with the Pharisees. The Pharisees come to Jesus in verse 11, and they're seeking a sign from him. They want a sign from heaven to determine who he is, whether he's truly from God. But Jesus doesn't give them one. He says, no, there will be no sign. Why does Jesus not give them a sign? Did Jesus just like wake up on the wrong side of the bed that morning? Like, did he get a cramp while he was sleeping in the boat and he just woke up with a bad mood and he's like, no, no more signs. Is that what's happening? I don't think so. I think Jesus rejects the Pharisees and their request for a sign because he knows what's in their hearts. He knows that they've already rejected him, that they come to him with this attitude of rejection. Look in verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. These words are hostile words. They're arrogant words. They come to Jesus with this attitude of, we know better than you do, and we're going to prove you wrong. They argue with Jesus. They debate. They dispute. Why do we argue with people? Husbands, why do you argue with your wives? I'll answer for all of you, to prove them wrong. Isn't that why we argue? From the youngest of ages to the oldest of ages, that's why we argue with people. It's because I'm right and you're wrong and I'm gonna prove it to you. That's the nature of an argument. We want to prove somebody wrong. That's what the Pharisees come to do, to prove Jesus wrong. They come seeking a sign. Now they're not just looking for a sign. We've seen this term seek pop up before in chapter three. When Jesus' mother and brothers were seeking Jesus, Lord, your uh, mother and brothers and sisters, they're outside and they're looking for you. They're seeking you. They're seeking to control you, to take charge of you. That's what the Pharisees are doing here. They're seeking Jesus. They're seeking a sign from Jesus so that they might control him. They want some kind of sign so that they can latch onto and determine. They come to test Jesus concerning his nature, concerning who he is. They attempt to discredit Jesus, to prove him false, to prove that he is not who he claims to be. What does all this hostile language indicate? What does it tell us? It tells us that the Pharisees come to Jesus with hearts of devout disbelief. They come to Jesus in dishonesty with this front of questioning and desiring to know. They've already seen and heard many, many signs, haven't they? The text has told us that they've been around for witnessing many of these things. The healings, the many, many healings, the exorcisms that took place, the preaching that Jesus was doing. They've been there. They've heard that. They've seen that. They don't come to Jesus wanting to believe. They don't come to Jesus because they just need a little bit more convincing. They don't come looking to change their minds as if they're like 98% of the way to believing Jesus and just give us one more sign and then we'll believe Jesus. That's all we need. That's not their hearts. That's not their attitude. How would you summarize the attitude of the Pharisees in one word or phrase? How has Mark described them? Just pick one phrase. What is it? How would you summarize that? Vipers? Vipers? That's biblical. Yeah. How else? Hypocrites. Absolutely. Absolutely. All of this flowing from this heart attitude of self-righteousness, pride, self-sufficiency. That's what their hearts are. That's, their hearts, according to Mark, are hard-hearted. They're not soft to the words of Jesus. They're rigid in staunch self-righteousness. They don't believe Jesus. He's shown them his power and authority over and over and over again. But they are filled not with humility, they're filled with self-importance. They are looking for an excuse to remain in their unbelief. They're not looking for a reason to believe. They're looking for a reason to remain in their self-righteous, self-sufficient way of thinking. What's wrong with the Pharisees? The Pharisees are spiritually blind and spiritually deaf. They do not understand. They do not not perceive who Jesus is. These two men, remember the bread on either side, the, the deaf and the blind? These two men serve as physical representations of where the Pharisees are spiritually. 
The Pharisees are spiritually blind, spiritually deaf. They do not see. They do not hear. They are arrogant. They are stubborn. They are hard-hearted. And as a result, they reject Jesus. They deny. They disbelieve. And they look for excuses to remain in their unbelief. Some of you here today come with the same attitude. Some of you have this attitude of self-sufficiency and self-righteousness. I don't need Jesus. I don't need him in my life. I'm doing quite fine on my own. I've got my works. I've got my law, just like the Pharisees. I don't need him. Some of you come with this attitude of really wanting to blame Jesus for your lack of faith. There's not enough signs. Jesus just hasn't given me enough reason to believe in him. I'll believe in him when he gives me more money or when he gives me that promotion or when he fixes my marriage or when that sickness is finally gone and dealt with, then I'll put my faith in him, but not until then. Just like the Pharisees, you're bartering with Jesus. You're trying to get Jesus to give you enough to validate or to make your faith worthy. Some of you want to determine how and when you'll come to Christ in faith. But we need to hear what the scriptures say loud and clear that God determines these things. We don't determine the how and the when. God does. God has said you must come to Christ now, today. And you must bow your knee now, today. You must not argue. You must not debate. You must fall down and worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what God has said. And if you reject Christ, if you remain Far off, if you decide to stand in your self-righteousness instead of bowing in humility, if you reject him now, he will reject you forever. You will have no place in his kingdom. The Pharisees had this persistent problem of pride that resulted in continuing disbelief. And Jesus rejected them. He walked away because of their hard-heartedness, because of their lack of faith. What a sharp warning for those who stand outside of Christ. You cannot make demands of Christ. Don't climb that fence of self-righteousness. You will receive nothing from Christ if you refuse to bow the knee in humble submission. So this warning is for those on the outside, for the Pharisees, for the crowds, for those who stand outside of fellowship with Jesus Christ. But what we see is, shockingly, it's also for those on the inside. For the disciples. Look at how Jesus uses this interaction with the Pharisees as a springboard to speak to the disciples. Here we move from, from what the meat is, we move to what surrounds the meat, the filling, whatever it may be. Ketchup, mustard, mustard's gross, it shouldn't be mustard, but whatever you want, here's the fillings, okay? Look at what Jesus says in verse 15. Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. What is this leaven that Jesus is warning them about? What's he saying beware to? Well, if we, if we look at what was just exposed in the previous verses, we see that it's this hard attitude of self-righteousness, self-sufficiency that leads to disbelief. Watch out for pride. But remember who Jesus is warning here. He's not warning the crowds or the Pharisees at this point. He's in the boat with his disciples. He's warning his friends, his followers, his people. He's warning his disciples of the devastating nature of of pride, Watch out that your hearts do not become like the Pharisees, that you do not allow this cold and hard-heartedness creep into your soul so that you become distanced from the truth of who Jesus is. But why warn his disciples? Is this a re relevant warning for them? Absolutely. Because even disciples of Jesus can be drawn away by pride. Have you felt that? Have you felt the temptation to be self-reliant and self-able? And Jesus says all it takes is a little pride in the soul to ruin the whole. What does leaven do? What does yeast do? What? It raises the bread, causes the, the dough to rise. And how much yeast is needed to make that dough rise? Is it a one-to-one -one ratio, one cup of flour, one cup of yeast? All you need is a little bit. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. In fact, I don't know what would happen. It might be a fun school experiment to figure out what happens when you put that much yeast inside of that much dough. What kind of expansion would you get if you had a one-to-one -one ratio? You only need a little bit. 
The point that Jesus is making is not about the, the rising nature of dough, what leaven does. Jesus is talking about the infecting nature of leaven. And I use infecting purposefully. You only need a little bit and it infects the rest. Now that's a good thing when it comes to dough, but it's a negative thing that Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is saying that even a small hint of self-sufficiency, a small hint of self-righteousness, a small little dabble of pride, and that ruins the whole. What happens when pride has taken root in the soul? What kind of fruit does it produce? Well, as we've seen in the heart of the Pharisees, that root of self-righteousness and pride, it results in the fruit of that heart that has taken root. That fruit is disbelief, which is exactly what has begun to blossom in the lives of the disciples. That's exactly what we see in this filling section here. They've been showing evidence of spiritual blindness similar to that of the Pharisees. Look at verse four. We've got another large crowd. They've been with Jesus three days. They're hungry and tired, and some are even close to fainting. Jesus doesn't want to send them away. How do the disciples respond when Jesus says, I want to feed them? I want to give them food. I want to make them well. I want to make them whole so that they don't die on the way home. How do they respond to the compassionate heart of Christ? Look in verse four. But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? What do they do? They question Jesus, they doubt Jesus, they disbelieve Jesus, just like the Pharisees do. Had they forgotten about Jesus' power? Have they forgotten about the previous miraculous feeding that Jesus has already done? Had they forgotten about the, the many, 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 many miracles that Jesus had already performed? I don't think so, look in verse 19. When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? Jesus questions them about the event that they were present for, and they answer correctly, 12. They remember just fine. They don't question Jesus because they haven't witnessed his power and authority, the accusation that the Pharisees bring. They question Jesus even though they've witnessed it because they're blind and deaf as well. They too have hard hearts. They don't understand. Their physical eyes and ears are working. They've taken it all in, and yet, they don't understand. Their spiritual eyes and ears have been stopped. Look at verses 14 through 16. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. What do the disciples think Jesus is talking about? They only have one loaf. Watch out for leaven. They discuss bread. What is their understanding of the words of Jesus Christ? That he's talking about literal bread, a physical loaf. They think that Jesus is rebuking them, scolding them for not bringing enough bread. They just had seven baskets full left over. What did they do with that? I don't know. But they clearly didn't bring, with it, bring it with them in the boat. And they think they're being slapped on the hand because they didn't bring enough bread. They don't understand that Jesus is using bread, leaven, yeast of the Pharisees. They don't realize that Jesus is teaching them something. That Jesus is using that as an illustration. They don't see, they don't hear, they don't perceive, they don't understand. Their hearts are hard to the teaching that Jesus is bringing. They are, at best... They are not the same as the Pharisees. They are counted on the inside. That's been made clear as we work through Mark's gospel. But they are at best like this partially seeing blind man. The blind man is healed in two stages. Not because Jesus ran out of power before he could heal the man the full way. It's not like he had to recharge his battery so he could get the guy to full healing. This man is a picture of where the disciples are. Partially seeing but also mostly blind. They see a little, like the man saw a little. I see people, but they just look like trees walking around. They don't see fully. Some of us need to hear this warning from Jesus. Some of us have allowed this attitude of self-sufficiency and, and pride to come into our hearts, to take root, and it's resulted in disbelief. Not in a salvific Disbelief, the Pharisees don't believe on a whole other scale compared to the disciples. They believe and yet they don't believe. 
They see and yet they don't see. They hear, but they still struggle to understand what they hear. They don't have full sight, full belief. And we struggle with this too. We struggle with disbelief that results in doubting God's power and goodness in the world. Do you believe that, that God has power to save? Do you? You're allowed to say yes or nod your head. Do you believe that God has power to save? The rebuke of Jesus Christ is then why don't you share the gospel? Why don't you pray for the lost? Because if you did, you would do these things. You would have faith displayed. You wouldn't question him, you wouldn't doubt him, you would show it. Do you believe that there is power in the gospel to save? Yes. Then why do we cower in fear when the culture stands up and denies the truth of the gospel? Why do we back away? Why do we bow to what culture says and not bow to what the truth of God's word says? Do you believe that that God is good and sufficient to care for your every need? Do you believe that? Then why do you worry? Why do you doubt? Why do you have fear? See, this rebuke comes very strongly against the Pharisees, but kind of like what God did in the book of Amos. I don't know if you've read the, the, the prophet Amos recently, but it begins in chapter one with this denunciation of, of all of the nations. Cursed be this nation, cursed be that nation. They've done this evil and wicked thing. They've, they've done this terrible thing. He just goes nation after nation after nation after nation, and you can just hear the, the nation of Israel just kind of standing up and applauding Amos going, yeah, that's right, preach hellfire and damnation against them. And then the prophet turns around in chapter two and he says, and that's just like what you are. And so we can be quick to cast stones against the dead, spiritually dead world around us, the spiritually dead and dying culture, and yet we need to hear what Christ says. He says, you're not out of the water yet. You still have this kind of temptation that could bring you down. Are you watching? Are you on guard? Don't climb the fence of doubt and disbelief. Is there a cure for this kind of disbelief? Is there something that can be done? We hear this warning and we go, yeah, that sounds pretty bad, but how do I stay away? How do I make sure that this kind of disbelief does not take over my heart, take over my life? To answer that question, we we look at what holds this whole section together. We look at the bread on the outside that keeps everything together that keeps the sandwich from falling apart. So let's look at the bread on the outside. It describes two different men. Two different men with two different kinds of illnesses, sicknesses, infirmities. One is deaf and mute, and the other is blind. They have different problems, but they have the same need. They both need Jesus to restore them, to give them back that which is broken. My ears don't work, I need that fixed. My eyes don't work, I need that fixed. Jesus is the only one that can do that. They are brought to Jesus by the crowds, by people, and they are asked, they ask Jesus, will you lay your hands on on these men? Will you heal them? And Jesus being the compassionate Christ, a theme that we've seen over and over and over again, Jesus being the merciful Messiah, he heals them, he restores them. And that doesn't surprise us, does it? to see Jesus healing and restoring, that doesn't shock us. What might shock us is the method that he uses. He uses his hands, his hands are involved once in plugging in a man's ears and once just in touching the blind man, touching his eyes, but he does something else that might seem a little strange. You may have noticed that when we read it. What does Jesus do? He spits. Anybody else going, what in the world is Jesus doing with this spit? Why would he do that? That just seems gross unsanitary, what's involved here? We've seen Jesus use his hands before, right? We've seen Jesus touch and bestow healing. The fever was driven from Peter's mother-in-law and the little girl was brought back to life when Jesus took them by the hand. He cleansed the leper through touch. He transferred his cleanness to somebody else and he drove back the illness. But does Jesus need to use his hands? Does he need to physically touch? No, he doesn't. We've seen examples of this, the paralytic man. What does he say? Get up and walk. He doesn't touch him, he just speaks words. The man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. 
and it is made whole. And the countless demon possessions that he has encountered, what does he do? He simply speaks. He doesn't need his hands. He will use his hands, but he doesn't need them. He doesn't need his hands or any other kind of props. Jesus does not do a jig before he brings about a miraculous healing. There's no incantation. There's no kind of stick waving or wand waving like a magician. There's none of that there. He simply heals. So why does Jesus spit? Why does he incorporate that into his healing routine? Well, we know it's not because he needed some extra special source of power, right? We know he doesn't need that. Jesus doesn't even have to be physically present with a sick person to make them well. You may not have remembered, but if you flip back to the section right before where we started in verses 24 through 30, Jesus heals a a girl, a daughter of the Syrophoenician woman. The Syrophoenician woman comes to Jesus and says, I need you to heal my daughter. She's sick, she's possessed, and she's back home. And Jesus heals this girl We don't know how far away she was or where the house was. We don't even know if the disciples had any idea where this home was. And yet Jesus knew exactly where this girl was and was able to provide healing even from a distance. He doesn't need to be physically present to bestow healing. So the spit, whatever it means, it's not for Jesus' benefit. It's not because it gave, gave him greater power, which means the spit, not being for Jesus, is for somebody else's benefit. It's for the benefit of those witnessing the miracle, for the man, for the crowds that witnessed this, for the disciples that were standing there, for Mark's readers who are listening and hearing this account. It's for the benefit of you and I to understand something about Jesus. Scholars debate the cultural significance of spit. I'm pretty sure I I saw some people wrote their dissertations on the cultural significance of spit in the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of John, where Jesus spits and makes mud and puts it on a blind man's eyes. There was this prevailing belief in the ancient Mediterranean world that saliva held some kind of healing properties to it, that it was kind of a a medical mixed with magic kind of thing that when you spit, there was transference of healing involved. So there are some that want to say that Jesus, he doesn't need it, so it's not like he's using it in a magical way, but Jesus is using some cultural idea to give these men assurance that they're about to be healed. That he's using this cultural prop of spit as a way to communicate that they're about to be healed. There may be some truth to that idea, but I'm not convinced that's why Jesus spits here. And I'm not convinced because Jesus is often seen as going against the grain of society, not going with it. Jesus is often using things that are countercultural. His ministry is distinctly countercultural, not running with the culture and using the culture. His methods are always different. So while there may be some relevance in discussing the cultural significance of saliva, I'm not convinced that Jesus spits because of some ancient medical magical practices. I think the important question for us as Bible believers is how does the Bible handle spit? That's a weird question. You can go home and do some research on what does the Bible have to say about spit? Let me summarize it for you very quickly. It's pretty much always seen in a negative context. There's something negative being communicated. In Leviticus chapter 15, the Mosaic law, spit could transfer uncleanness from one person to another. If one person was unclean and they spit on somebody else, that person became unclean, they had to disrobe, they had to wash their clothes, wash themselves, and they were unclean until evening. In Numbers chapter 12, uh, Aaron and Miriam rise up against Moses. Aren't we just as good as Moses? Hasn't God given us power and authority just like Moses? And God strikes Miriam with leprosy. Aaron and Miriam go, okay, Moses, we stepped out of line. Please pray to the Lord. Moses prays, and she's healed. But he says that if her father had but spat on her, would she not be shamed for seven days? So put her out of the camp for seven days, and then she'll be clean and can come back in. Spit transfers shame. It transfers uncleanness. Is spitting on someone usually a sign that you like them? Do you ever walk up to somebody instead of shaking their hand, spit on their forehead? No, that is, that is never, it is never taken as a sign of acceptance and welcome. It's always a sign of, of derision or hatred. 
a desire to shame somebody or make fun of somebody. There's a sign of scorn. What did the Romans do before they crucified Jesus? They beat him, they whipped him, they scourged him, they made fun of him, and they spit on him. They spit on him as a sign of scorn and rejection. So what is Jesus doing with spit? It's a negative thing to do. It's a shameful thing to do. Is he attempting to shame these two men? Does he spit on them because he's disgusted by them, that he's rejecting them? Is that what he's doing? No, of course not. Jesus spits to show us how restoration will take place. He's teaching us something about the means of restoration. Our big question is, there's hard-heartedness that leads to disbelief. How is that fixed? Jesus is saying that the way we are fixed is through something that the world sees as shameful, that the world sees as disgusting, as, as reproachful. What kind of things are shameful in the eyes of the world? Weakness, being a servant of somebody else, submission, Admittance of wrong, admittance of insufficiency, summarize all of that. The world sees humility as a despicable and shameful thing. The world says you must be strong, self-assured, confident, forceful, that you know what you're doing, that you've got it all together. That's what it means to be a strong individual in this world. But the gospel says you must be humble, you must be least of all, you must be dependent, you must admit that you're weak, Signs of shame according to the world. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. That's exactly what the world says is shameful and should be tossed away. That's truly countercultural to have Jesus telling us these things. Jesus is showing us through the use of saliva, through the use of spit, how we are restored to spiritual wholeness. This method is physically applied here to these two men. But we're meant to see this in connection with the spiritual restoration that's needed as well. Remember, the focus of our sandwich, spiritual disbelief, spiritual doubt. How are we healed? Not through the world's means, not through what the world sees as right and good. It's actually something the world sees as shameful. We're not restored through prideful measures. We're restored through that which the world sees as a disgrace, humility and an admittance of weakness. What is Jesus saying? Get off the fence and bow the knee. Uh, My girls often come to mom and dad looking for help, asking for help in some capacity. Most recently, when they were at the end of their toothpaste tube, they were asking for some help to get that last little bit of toothpaste onto their toothbrush. It's too hard, too difficult, And uh, thankfully, we got a new tube of toothpaste, so I don't have to help him every time. As parents, we long for the day where our kids become self-sufficient, right? We long for the day when we don't have to change diapers, when we don't have to help them go to the bathroom, when we don't have to help them get them dressed, when we don't have to help them take a shower. We long for that day where they become self-sufficient. Any other parent willing to say amen to that? Yes, okay. We, We look forward to that day. We long for the day when they are self-sufficient, but we must be careful in teaching our children to become self-sufficient in the right things, that we do not communicate an attitude that contradicts the nature of the gospel, humble dependence on Christ. Become self-sufficient in brushing your teeth, but recognize that you will never be sufficient enough in the eyes of the Lord. Yes, I want you to be able to dress yourself, but you cannot clothe yourself in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That he must do for you. Jesus is telling us something about our attitude towards him, what it ought to be. But he's also telling us something about himself, about how he will bring about the restoration of his people. How will Jesus restore humanity? How is he going to fix people How is he going to fix the brokenness, the spiritual brokenness that rests on the world? How does he do it? You can answer that. How does Jesus fix people? How are our hearts made whole? What is it that fixes us? The suffering and death of Jesus Christ. Suffering is seen as shameful. Death is seen as the ultimate shame. There is no honor in death. No matter what culture says, 
There is no death in dignity, or dignity in death, I got that backwards. There is no dignity, because you're dead. And yet through this, Christ brings restoration. He brings something that makes us whole. Jesus is actually teaching us something about the nature of the gospel itself when he uses spit. It's incredible, it's remarkable. What do we see if we step back and look at the big picture of the gospel of Mark? We're looking at the big picture of this section, but take one more step back and have chapter one and chapter 16 at the end. What's the big picture that we see? Well, in the first eight chapters, well, eight, first seven, eight is kind of that hinge point, but for the first half of the book, what do we have? We have this clear, bold, loud declaration that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and he has come to restore his people. He has come to make his people whole again. He comes preaching the gospel. He's going to make his people well again. He comes to redeem and restore. That's the first half. Then the second half, which we're gonna dive into in the coming weeks, we see the description